This morning is one of those special events where we recognize everybody who's been working on Cathedral Giving by Design, what used to be the Cathedral Antique Show. And I'm going to uh, introduce Julia Michener um, because she's now, and she has been for some time, kind of overseeing outreach ministries at the cathedral and especially being our clergy liaison for um, the Cathedral Giving by Design and for all of our outreach ministries. But first, I will open with prayer and then let Julia Michener introduce our special guest. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this holy place, this Cathedral of St. Philip, and all the various ministries that emerge from our prayer and from our service. We give you thanks especially this day for our outreach ministries, for the history of the Cathedral Antique Show, and the future of Cathedral Giving by Design, and all the beautiful volunteers and workers who make this such a great event, and will make it a great event in this coming January. We gather and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please welcome, not our Cathedral Giving by Design people, but our Canon for Outreach and Social Ministries, Julia Michener. Julia. Thank you, Dean Candler. Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here with you all today. I'm always excited on Sunday mornings to be here with all of you, but particularly on this day, because uh, as Dean Candler was saying, my work as, as canon for mission here involves getting to minister alongside so many of you and so many of our outstanding outreach programs here at the cathedral that reach into the Atlanta community and beyond to the nation and to the world. And I'm not supposed to have favorites, but of course, like, like anyone, I, I have my my ministries that I work with, our ministries, our mutual ministries that I feel especially drawn to and especially proud of and grateful for and that I feel are in especially impactful ways for all of us here at the Cathedral of St. Philip to do the work of our patron, the Deacon Philip, to be of service to those who are vulnerable, to help lift up and empower those engaging new life and to learn, to learn from those in our community who, as uh, Dean Candler was speaking about, are often forgotten saints, but really are saints of God who have so much to teach us and so much life to give and show us. And so with all that said, Cathedral Giving by Design is one of the ministries we engage in here in this parish uh, about which I feel most excited and most proud. You know, over the past couple of years, uh, as Cathedral Giving by Design has um, been the, the most recent incarnation of the Cathedral Antique Show, which did so much good for so many years, we have been able to do incredible work with the Women's Resource Center to End Domestic Violence, and most recently last year, the Ansley School, where your generosity, the generosity of this community has enabled the Ansley School to put in a fifth grade class this year. So amazing, amazing work being done. This year, we have the great privilege to have as our beneficiary, Wellspring Living, you're going to hear a lot more about that from um, a number of people. But uh, first off, I want to introduce this year's co-chairs for the Cathedral Giving by Design, Rebecca Hollingsworth and Leslie Foster, uh, both of whom played integral roles in, in helping us call through our applications, all worthy applications to be this year's beneficiary and helped us uh, prayerfully decide on Wellspring Living as the 2025 beneficiary for Cathedral Giving by Design. So Leslie and Rebecca, thank you and welcome. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rebecca Hollingsworth, and this is Leslie Foster, and we are so, so, so excited about this year's Cathedral Giving by Design. We have um, 
gotten the patron letters out. We did go through a wonderful process of picking the beneficiary, which we are so excited about. And our big, before we introduce our speaker, um, our big introduction, our honorary co-chairs for this year that we are so, so, so honored to be working alongside are Nancy and Randy Riser. Y'all stand. They are longtime members of the cathedral and have served our community in many ways. And Nancy has already helped us so much in our process um, this far. And our wonderful committee. We have a fabulous committee that Leslie and I could not be doing what we're doing without um, these wonderful people. So if you are on our committee and you are here, please stand so we can recognize you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And another important introduction, um, Michelle Nichols, um, who is standing right here to my left, she is a new staff member at the cathedral and she has done so much to help us. Um, she, I don't think our patron letters would have gone out without <laughs> Michelle's you, help Michelle. and um, she's gonna be a, a great help for us. So um, we welcome you to the cathedral. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Leslie. Hi everybody, thanks also for being here. Um, I will introduce our beneficiary this morning, and I also wanted to make note that, like Julia said, so many people here in this room have been involved with Cathedral Giving by Design or the Cathedral Antique Show in some of its different iterations. And because of you, you have made the event have such an amazing reputation. Um, it's really so unique, I think, of an event to be able to combine design appreciation and lovely things with also such a meaningful cause every year. And I think that that's a very unique opportunity um, to combine those two fun and meaningful things and really have an impact. So because of the wonderful reputation of our congregation and this event, the um, applications came in and they were all very strong. Um, it was very exciting and humbling to go through all of them and try to make a prayerful and thoughtful choice. But the Wellspring Living application really stood out to us. Um, they are such a great group in our community doing work on a big problem. And as we are a big congregation, um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to tackle something that can really have an impact. And I'm so excited to introduce uh, a member of our cathedral as well, Dr. Alyssa Tertichny. She is the Chief Program Officer for Wellspring Living, and she will give us a short presentation, and hopefully there should be some time for questions. But also, um, there's some information on the coffee table. Please take the flyers or hang around if you have any extra questions. We're so glad to answer anything for you, and we welcome your support. Thank you, Dr. Alyssa. Good morning. I am so, so glad to be with you this morning to share about something that is so precious to my heart. And I was sharing with Leslie and Rebecca that this whole process for me has been just personally a, a confirmation of my faith to get to see the ministry that I've dedicated my career to, supported and walked alongside of by the cathedral where I get to practice my faith. So just so much gratitude to this community um, for letting me sit in this intersection of the work um, to really, and especially this, even the service this morning talking about um, how the works really let us live out our faith. I'm excited to get to work with you all and to share about Wellspring Living. So we are Wellspring Living, and if you're not familiar with us, we are about a 23-year-old organization that serves in the Atlanta and Georgia area. Our mission is to transform the lives of those at risk or victimized by sexual exploitation. And our vision is to see a world where every victim of exploitation has access to transformative care. And so that's the work that we get to do each and every day. 
But to really set this up for you, it helps to have a little bit of an understanding about what the issue of commercial sexual exploitation is. There are other words for that or terms for that. You may know this issue as sex trafficking, or as domestic minor sex trafficking. Um, it has many names. Um, but for us, when we look at this issue, we're realizing that this is a big issue. Human trafficking is estimated to be a $150 billion industry worldwide. And traffickers don't target people, they target vulnerabilities. So when someone is looking to exploit another person, this issue really starts to connect with a lot of other social issues that we see in our communities. Things like trauma and abuse, housing instability, substance use, mental health, poverty, all of these things, all of these social issues really intersect to create and cultivate an environment where exploitation is possible. And in order to address and prevent sex trafficking, we have to serve survivors with a comprehensive system of support that addresses all of this wide range of vulnerabilities. So it's a big task and it's exciting work. 83% of survivors are brought into trafficking by a partner, close friend, or family member. So sometimes we think that this is something that happens far away, but a lot of times this, these issues are happening within the context of families, communities, and relationships. 64% of victims are experiencing homelessness when they're recruited into a trafficking situation. This may be a means to get shelter over your head, and it comes at a great cost. 62% of survivors struggled with alcohol, illicit prescription drug use in their past, or other substances. And that can go two ways. Sometimes substance use can really mask the pain of being trafficked and it perpetuates it. And sometimes using then creates a situation where someone is more vulnerable to be exploited, but it becomes a vicious cycle either way. And then 75% of trafficking survivors describe access to mental health care or behavioral health services as a top need. It's really important when we're doing this recovery work, there's physical healing and emotional and mental healing that have to happen in that process of recovery. And 72% of survivors experienced food insecurity during their childhood. So access to basic needs, having things like shelter and food and education really are things that we can do as a community to prevent people from having these types of experiences. And also want to note that 35% of children who are victimized by sexual exploitation are boys. This is not just an issue of girls. And I think that that's especially important for us to think about that Wellspring also, we have a Receiving Hope Center, which is one of our programs that serves youth of all genders. So what is our approach, right? We'd have this huge issue. It's a little overwhelming. And so where do we even start? And so for Wellspring Living, our approach is to serve survivors and those at risk who are 12 years and older through a comprehensive, trauma-informed, survivor-centered approach that really offers and meets the full spectrum of needs. And we do that through housing, healing, and education. So for us, we know that housing, having a stable place to live, a safe place to live, an affordable place to live, is the foundation for recovery. Housing creates a path towards independence, and for our youth, oftentimes family reunification, and for women who are working towards having custody of their children back, having a safe place for them to be can really help families come back together after um, incredibly difficult circumstances. Healing is a critical step towards recovery, and for many of the folks that we serve, it's a lifelong process of moving through each step, each day, um, to get to a place where you can really fully experience your worthiness and function at the level that you want and need to, to, foresee, to live out your dreams in your life um, and to become a contributing member of society. And if true healing doesn't occur, survivors likely return to the life. And so we have people who are experiencing life on a very different plane than most of us in our culture, right? So it's a really tough integration. And by walking alongside and supporting that healing process, people can reacclimate to a healthy, stable life. 
And finally, education opens the doors to financial empowerment. Survivors with a GED or a high school diploma are more likely to achieve living wage employment. Right? There's a lot of barriers if you're missing those educational markers to say, I would like to have another way to gain an income that can support myself and my family. If that can't happen, right, then it creates an opportunity or unfortunately a circumstance where people may end up back in a trafficking situation if they're not able to get their needs met in another way. So we know that those educational pillars through training with apprenticeship partners and corporate partners and um, that those things really make a difference for people to have another healthy way to make an income for their families. And so founded on these three pillars, we serve women and children who have survived trafficking or faced associated vulnerabilities that can lead to trafficking and past, uh, to, that can lead to trafficking. These are things like past trauma, homelessness, having a criminal record. And so at Wellspring Living, we not only want to care deeply for those who have survived these experiences, but we'd also like to have less people in our community have to experience them by being both a both a part of that healing process and a part of that prevention for folks too. And we have a couple of different types of programs that help us to meet these needs in our community. The first is our residential programs. Our flagship program is our women's residential program that opened around 2001. And that's a long-term treatment program for women ages 18 and older who have experienced trafficking as well as women at risk. Our girls' residential program opened in 2008, and that is a long-term treatment program for girls ages 12 to 17 who are confirmed for childhood sexual exploitation to receive long-term care. And our Receiving Hope Center that I mentioned already was established in 2020, one of our newer programs. And it's a 90-day stabilization program for youth of all genders. And it's typically the first place that a youth will come when they are recovered from a trafficking situation to be able to access mental health care, a safe place to be, forensic interviewing, medical services, all in one place so that they're not having to go to the hospital and the Child Advocacy Center and then to a nonprofit to get those needs met. We want them to be able to come to a place of safety and bring all the services to them where they are. We also have our post-program services. Um, so this involves case management and our bridge transitional living community. So we have case managers that walk alongside participants as they transition back to the community after being in treatment with us to make sure that that treatment or that that transition is successful and that they're able to access the ongoing treatment that they need at a lower level of care. And then our Bridge Apartments, which is one of our newer programs as well, opened in 2021. And that's um, transitional living apartments where women who have walked through our programs can come and live with their children in one and two bedroom apartments. Um, and that's up to two years that they can live and really practice those skills in a safe and supported environment. And we also have two community-based programs. One is our training institute. And through that institute, we can teach other organizations in the Atlanta area and the Georgia area and around the country and the world who want to do this work, what we've learned. So we provide mentorship, trainings, conferences to really do the advocacy and education work. And then also our Women's Academy serves women 18 and up who are interested in having an opportunity to receive GED training as well as professional development while receiving those wraparound services as well. So they still have access to clinical case management, life skills, um, and a really supportive staff because we know that the education is important, but it's not the end. People also need access to that great sense of community and deep care. And so since 2001, we've been able to directly support over 2,400 domestic sex trafficking survivors and those at risk on their path to self-sufficiency through our proven and industry-leading approach. And yes, there are still many unmet needs, particularly related to long-term housing, advocate education, and career development. So we still have work to do. And the Welcome Home campaign, which is so beautifully aligned with the work of the Cathedral Giving by Design, um, we are working um, to wrap up this campaign. We're, oh, we're doing um, breaking ground shortly on our South Atlanta campus um, to develop out and increase our capacity to serve in our community. So we will be um, expanding our therapy services and our housing services on that campus through this campaign. 
and giving more survivors a safe place to call home as they journey to wholeness. And so right now we can serve around 500 women and children per year, and this campaign will allow us to increase that to have capacity to serve over 750 women and children per year. Our campus, this says eight, and it's actually, we just got some additional property from the Department of Transportation, so we'll have actually around 10 acres where we can house youth um, in our residential program. Our girls' residential program will actually transition to a youth residential program where we will be able to expand long-term access to treatment to youth of all genders in addition to just those who identify as girls. We'll have an education and activities building that allows the youth to have a place to go to school and to do physical activities and fun enrichment activities. And then also working towards a goal of 18 tiny homes for program graduates, as well as other survivors in our community who are ready for an independent living level of care to come and live with their children. And this excitingly will also give us the opportunity to add three bedrooms um, in that independent living stage in addition to the one and two bedrooms that we have in our bridge apartments. And our Women's Academy will move on site. So we will also have the opportunity for folks who are living on campus to have such easy access to the counseling, clinical case management, and educational services that the organization provides just walking distance, which is really, really exciting for us. So our expanded campus will serve as a home to our institute, which is our training um, program, and we'll also be able to have a place for uh, anti-trafficking organizations to come and learn and train with us as we do the work. So just very excited about this. And to give you a little bit of a visual, um, this is what the campus map plan is. And so in the center, I'll highlight us there, is where those tiny homes community will be. In the front, we'll have that front big administrative building that houses our admin, our institute, and our women's academy, and our bridge apartments, that middle part, the tiny homes, and in the back will be where the youth are situated behind a little bit of extra security. So really having an opportunity. Right now, the only part of this campus that is developed is that first third. So we'll be really tripling the space that we have to serve and utilize, which is super, super exciting. Um, and also, especially as we talk about this opportunity that we have to walk alongside each other, I wanted to talk about our um, bridge program as an example. Um, these are some images from the bridge transitional living apartments that we have, which is the closest in concept to the tiny homes that we'll be developing. So you can see when a woman um, walks into her apartment, this is the type of space that she's walking into right now. Um, it's fully furnished for them. It has all of their cookware, plates, utensils, towels, linens. Um, bedding so that when they get there, all they have to do is bring themselves and their clothing. They don't have to be responsible for furnishing that place. And we're working on partnerships that now even allow them to take that furniture with them to their first long-term home when they leave um, their time with us. And then on the right side of this, you can see a rendering for the two bedroom tiny homes. So they're connected by a storage unit, and then they all have a primary bedroom in the back, smaller bedroom for the children. And so we will also have three bedrooms where there would be two secondary bedrooms, a bathroom for their family, a kitchen and dining space, living room, and then a front porch that is just theirs, and then a storage unit to hold any of those extra belongings that they need to hold. And for this event, the proceeds from the Cathedral Giving by Design will be used to construct at least three welcoming and healing tiny homes on this campus for Wellspring Living. So you will be a part of bringing these homes to life for our survivors. So why I get involved, why I connect with us, I wanted to share a little bit about the impact of the work. Um, we launched this year a participant feedback survey because we wanted to hear more from our participants how they were experiencing our services and also how we can help um, learn how to continue to grow and develop our programming. But for post-program support, which is the department where these tiny homes will be housed, the um, participants rated satisfaction on quarter one as a 4.55 out of five, 
and in quarter two is a 4.06 out of five. And so the composite satisfaction rating looks at the facility, the staff, the counseling services, case management services, education and enrichment services. So the averages of those, our participants are really responding well to feeling like they're getting their needs met in the services that this department provides. And in both quarter one and quarter two of this year, 100% of the participants who took the survey said that they would recommend the program to someone else. So we're really excited to know that those who are engaging with us are benefiting from their experience because they are the ones who are doing the work. We just have the honor to walk alongside them and give them the space to heal. And then in the surveys, we also have some just text boxes where people can leave us feedback. One of the questions that we ask, as you saw on the last slide, was about if they would recommend the program and then why or why not. And these are some of the comments that people left. In quarter one, we had a participant say, it saved my life and put me back on track with my future. In quarter two, we had a participant say, Live, Wellspring Living turned out to be the absolute best thing for my life during a time of crisis and hopelessness. They were the springboard that lifted me up out of the toughest time in my life. They nurtured, supported, encouraged, loved, and worked hard for me to return to me and to go beyond and become the best me I could be. I would recommend any woman who is looking to turn her life and the life of her children around to Wellspring Living. Each phase of the program patiently and lovingly guided and ushered me to the next phase to ensure I not only received help, but would leave with the tools and support to help myself going forward. And finally, in quarter two, another participant said, they are great for women like me that have been trafficked and need help to get through. The program is great for getting to the next part of your life after everything. So we hold, I mean, it is the honor of our lives to get to do this work and to serve these women. Um, and to watch them experience this type of progress and success is just, it's why I keep getting up every day and going back to do this work because it just inspires me so much to see these women just experience their wholeness. And so one of our participants who currently lives in the bridge, she's a graduate of other programs, wanted to make a video for you all to share. So that's what you're going to see on this next slide. So I'm going to keep us moving just for the sake of time, and we'll try to get the video pulled up from another source um, before you wrap up, because it is a sweet video. And if we can't get it up today, we can surely send it out. So as we sit with these things, there's an action piece involved in taking the next step forward together. And so I think the exciting thing or the encouraging thing about this work is that everybody can make a difference in solving this issue and responding to this issue. And so we invite you to activate your advocacy alongside of us to be a part of the solution. And so there's many ways that you can get involved with Wellspring Living to serve survivors and those at risk. And these are just some of the examples. First, tell a friend as you learn about this issue, share what you're learning with your community. Start those conversations because we also know that this impacts the people around us. And so the more that we talk about it, the more we talk about this with our families, with our children, with our loved ones, we create a protective barrier around those that we love. Also serve survivors as a volunteer. Ours is one of many agencies in the Atlanta area that serves this population. And so anybody who's interested, if you have, and I would say too, everyone has something to give too. So if you're crafty, if you're a math person, if you just like to be with people, if you're like, I don't wanna to talk to anyone, but I will take a broom, like there's something for everyone to get involved. And so um, reach out and see what you can do as a volunteer. Invest in solutions. So if you are someone who is able to give financially, there are opportunities to make investments um, to support the organizations that are doing this work and bringing us forward. And then provide a monthly gift or donate um, clothes to Treasures. Treasures is our retail, our upscale resale store, where if you have beautiful, um, lightly used furniture items or clothes, we can resell those for a profit that then pr those proceeds go to support our work and our programs. Host or attend a Wellspring Living event to share with your community. We have our big gala coming up next week. We always have something going on too. So I'd say stay in touch with us. Check out our website. We have a big spring event that we do as well as our gala in the fall. 
and then connect to help. So you can support it when you encounter, or if you encounter, or if you see something suspicious, have the hotlines plugged into your phone to be able to reach out to support and help those in your community get the help that they need. And so this number that you see on that bottom is the National Human Trafficking Hotline, or the 24-hour Human Trafficking Hotline. I recommend folks to Google those numbers and add them in your phone just to have them in case you ever need them. And as we close out, just want to say we are so grateful. I know I said this at the beginning. I will echo it again. So grateful to partner with you to make it possible for survivors and those at risk to experience the joy of home. That's the incredible synergy of this work that we get to do together is we know how incredible it is to have a place that feels like home. And we get to create that um, in these tiny homes for this community. So thank you. And save the date, January 24th and 25th of 2025. Also wanna highlight just the, the coolness that this is January's Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So the fact that we get to do this event during a big awareness month is just so timely. And so we look forward to being with you in January to continue this conversation. So I'm going to leave some space for, for questions. I also want to introduce our chief, our chief executive officer, Christian Murphy, got to slip in uh, to join me as I was sharing. Do you want to say anything? Hi, good morning. Well, I mean, so first, this is my second church I've gone to today. I did not know I was going to be matching with you. So I mean, sometimes. We do plan the matching. Today, we didn't. We didn't. That's very, it's very organic. I was actually just up this street at Peachtree Prez, um, speaking to one of their Sunday Seekers class. And um, we've just had this really beautiful opportunity today, as we are actually a week out from our gala, to be out in the community. What, how beautiful it is that we get to be out and present with people who are already supporting us in really thoughtful ways before we invite others to come with us to be a part of this journey. I actually watched that video just maybe 15 minutes ago. Um, Mac and I actually just came back from Girl Scout camp um, from Camp Merriweather this morning. But the video is such a beautiful reminder of the hope of the opportunity, and I don't want to speak for that participant. I will let her speak for herself, and hopefully you all be able to see that video. But as many difficult things as we talk about on a regular basis, there's so much joy, there is so much opportunity, and there is so much grace that can continue to be given each and every day, but it's also given right back to us by those that we serve. And when we're at graduations, I know we were at that one this summer, um, I actually didn't cry that time, but you hear even youth say really powerful things. And I was just telling the Sunday school class that, you know, for youth, it's not as if you are raising your hand, you're like, yes, I want to be at Wellspring Living today. It is, I don't want to be here. I want to go back home. No matter what home looks like, even if home does not look like the love that we have in our own homes and with our own families, I remind people that sometimes you get so used to that traumatic experience that that's all you know. So it takes some time to let down your guards to really believe and trust other people, but then also most importantly to believe in yourself. I don't know if you talked about brain development at all, but I'm gonna go nerdy for five seconds. Um, even though Alyssa is the doctor on our team, I am not. Um, but one of the things that I have learned over time in this space in particular about women's and children's advocacy is about brain development. You know, when we think about the brain and we know that the brain isn't fully developed until you're in your mid-20s, I'm like, there's a lot of bad college decisions that happen along the way, right? Um, I think also that for teenagers, one of the reasons why it's sometimes hard to, dis to connect with them is because that emotional part of your brain is developing first. So everything that teaches you how to love deeply, how to care, how to be just happy, but also how to be very moody how to maybe be really disconnected from someone who's not cool. I'm often not cool in my house, especially that one. Um, but that also means that when you do get to meet someone and you feel like you can begin to trust them, how beautiful it can be to watch that unveil over time. And though it takes time, it is some of the most beautiful work that I've seen through our organization. And I've only been here for two years now. Um, but I'd say one more thing. We're, we had the video recording this week. You all, Rebecca and Leslie did an amazing job putting together, I mean, there was a great script. There was some great moments. You all will see it, I'm sure, over time. But you all have got a great team here. And the great ministry that you continue to do and the ways that you help uplift missions like ours is really, really beautiful. 
the way that you share it on your social and then you also share it in your home is such a special thing to us because just as Alyssa said, it's about taking that one thing that you can do and really like planting that seed somewhere else. So I'll pause now actually and let y'all see if y'all have any questions. We stand y'all into silence on a Sunday morning. How dare we? Yes. Yes. Um, so the answer to that question about how do people come to find Wellspring Living is it depends. So often for youth, about 70% of the youth who are in our care are part of the foster care system. So the foster care, um, their caseworker has asked for us to be their placement for example. Um, the others are also often referred to by their family members or someone who knows that they've been exploited. Every child that we serve has been, has had a confirmed case of sexual exploitation or human trafficking. So that's one delineation between children than it is for adults. And again, I'm sure you probably have said this already, but we serve youth 12 to 17. Now for adults 18 and up, that is a, a wide array. Sometimes it's through partnering organizations. Sometimes it's often actually through word of mouth. Someone who graduated from our program tells their friend is at, you know, whether it's a pickup line, like, hey, I don't know if you heard about this organization, but look at what, look at what I've been able to do. That often happens as well. But I'd say partnering organizations is a great way to get the word out. And then also um, the hotline, right? So if you call the hotline or whether the law enforcement is calling the hotline, they're often looking for places and organizations like ours. When you look at um, academic literature, some of it suggests that there are 60% or so unreported cases due to stigma, stereotypes, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. How do you combat that? I mean, I think that you, you probably have a great answer to this. I'll only offer this. It's really about giving more awareness as much as we can, talking about this issue, having conversations like these are really beautiful ones. Our training institute that was in the very beginning of the slide goes out to organizations not only across our state, but also across the country to also make sure that we're talking and spreading awareness and preventive efforts around um, this issue. I'd say being in schools is a really beautiful thing when you can be, it can be very complex. So often we get the question like, well, are you going to schools on a regular basis? Sometimes we we try, right? We actually had a program called Youth Academy that used to be in Phoenix Academy off of Memorial Drive out in East Atlanta. COVID has changed a lot of the ways that people are able to go into organizations in particular schools. Um, one of the things that I know is that the issue of trafficking is brought up in curriculum in Georgia. It's brought up in high school PE. Um, I happen to have a daughter who's an athlete, so she's in PE right now. However, for some students, it may not happen until your senior year. If we are waiting until kids are in high school to talk about this issue, we've waited far too long. We know that the average age of someone entering the life is only 14 years old. We've got a lot of work to do, even in a well-resourced state like Georgia who really believes in fighting this issue and making it clear that trafficking isn't safe here. We still have a lot to do to help spread awareness. Do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I can, that's a great question too. And I think the exciting thing is that we are seeing better reporting. The challenging thing is that trafficking, what we understand about it continues to evolve so quickly, especially in this COVID and post COVID era where a lot of the ways that we thought about trafficking occurring have shifted to more online and technology based platforms or just it's, we have to keep up. Um, but there was a really interesting study I said on the human trafficking uh, task force for the state. And one of our work groups just did a study where they interviewed survivors about communication and advertising strategies. And a lot of the survivors shared that they saw all this marketing materials, like, you know, you go to the airport or you see those signs like human trafficking survivor call to get help. And they're like, I didn't know that that was talking about me. And so I think part of our job is to say, this isn't just something that looks like something that happens in another country. We can tell um, more information about all of the different ways that this occurs so that people can say, oh, this, I am someone who is impacted by this and I'm, I'm able to reach out for help or I'm worthy of seeking services or this, this advertisement applies to me. So a lot of it is really expanding the narrative about what this looks like so that people who are who would benefit from being able to seek help actually recognize that the help is there for them. So, so mine is really simple. My eyes are really bad. You have three logos or badges on there. Um, and oh, yeah. obviously it's important to you because they're on there. Can you yeah. 
maybe describe those a little bit? Wow, can I describe them? Um, So the bottom left one, I actually don't know what this one is. Platinum Transparency 2024 Candid. Do you know what that one is? Don't let me tell a story. This is from our training institute. So I, Christian and I, I know the, I I love how we're like looking so closely. I think the one all the way to the right is Safe House Project. They are a certifying body. Um, So they make, they, if you have programs that serve survivors, they will come and audit you basically to make sure that you are meeting certain standards. So we have a gold with them. ECFA is the one. So ECFA is, I'm really bad at acronyms if they're not mine. So ECFA is also another body that also helps to to federate organizations like ours. And I believe it's the first two letters I think are evangelical Christian. I believe that's correct. And so one of the things that they do is also make sure that people who give through ECFA, there are ECFA donor advised funds, also know that there are organizations that have been vetted by them. So they also have, a, um, I'd say, a unique auditing process for us that might be very different than a traditional audit as well. Is it Evangelical Christian Federation Authority or something like that? There are certifying bodies, which obviously your simple question turned out to be the hardest one. (laughs) Well, now I'm like, what's candid? I don't know. (laughs) And was there another question over here? Or I can also pass this microphone over here. Y'all are so quiet over here. No questions? Okay. Making sure I'm not missing anyone. Ah, we've got several campuses. Um, so we've got one which we call like the South Campus, and it's in um, the South Fulton area. And that's where our girls residential program is, as well as our bridge transitional apartments. It's where those tiny homes are going to be as well. And then our Cornerstone op- building is going to be there. I don't know if you, I think you had a map before. That Cornerstone building is going to help us to bring our admin office, our women's academy that does that GED to apprenticeship track, as well as our training institute. And then we'll continue to have another campus that's up in Gwinnett. That's our women's residential program. That is a very special place and also very well secluded. And then we'll continue to also have our Receiving Hope Center. And that's that 90-day crisis program for youth. That's up towards me in Paulding County. Between all of our sites, Oh, well now, and our Women's Academy is in Haightville and Sandy Springs. Um, there used to be 273 miles between them all. Now I haven't added in Haightville and Sandy Springs. So now I want to know if we added those. It does. That's why we have try to have as many fuel-efficient cars as possible. Um, and also, I mean, that's also one of the things that I think is really important. When we were celebrating Mary Frances, our founder, there's so many things that we had to say about her, right? She did this work for more than 22 years. She was a retired kindergarten teacher who was just really passionate about women's ministry. We could not replace her with one person. She retired at the end of last year. Yes, December 2023. And I think her grandkids were the ones who probably pushed her into retirement. Um, But one of the things that I say very often is I'm not trying to fill in Mary Frances' shoes, but there's a whole team. The things that she did for the first many years of Wellspring Living were tremendous. And were it not for faith, and were it not for partnership and supporters all across greater Atlanta, we wouldn't exist to be being here today. There are other great organizations that are continuing to come up across our state and it's beautiful to see, but we have to have multiple locations, not just because of the work that we do, but also try to try and maintain the anonymity of the work that we do as much as possible. So I think in some ways we kind of talk about how we're like this best kept secret, which has been really lovely for 20 years. But as we move into this next, I guess, for lack of a better word, this transition of leadership, but more so about the transition of the work that we do, we have to be more thoughtful about not being as much of a secret. We have to be really thoughtful about being more forward-facing as much as possible, where as, and as safely as possible, right? Um, to make sure that we are not only helping spread awareness, but also being there for people who need us most. We want to make it as easy as possible to, for people to find us. Great question. Yes. I'm wondering if there are uh, any lobbying attempts throughout the country to, I would hope, try to obtain federal funding for yeah. programs such as this throughout the United States. There's some amazing lobbying efforts that happen not, happen not only in the state of Georgia, but also across our country. Um, for example, actually, Senator Ossoff has worked very recently to try and make it easier for access to federal funding. 
I am a fundraiser at heart. I have been doing this for since that kid's been born, 14 years. Love it. However, to apply for a federal grant is no easy feat. And then once you get it, it's great and it's a blessing and it's like big money. There's a lot of work to maintain it. And the regulations and the reporting is quite significant. And to be honest, in all fairness, we don't want to be giving taxpayers money to just any organization, right? You want to make sure that your money is going to what you want it to go to and how you want to be supported. So I understand the need for reporting, but it also means that we have to train our team. We have to do monthly reports around timesheets. We have to do kind of quarterly larger reports. And then every three years, we're applying for federal funding again. And for an organization like ours with a budget of about $9 million, that federal funding is so significant that every time I hear that the government is trying to debate about the budget and if it's going to get passed or not, those are the things that make me hold my breath, right? Those are the ways that we really need to make sure we're being thoughtful about advocating for continued resources, but also continued conversation. Because we're not always going to agree about every little thing, but there's many ways that we can agree and supporting people who need us most is kind of one of those ways. And so I really hope that we continue to see more advocacy on that side. And I'd say you can also keep an eye on... Um, Oh, well, I guess they don't they're as public. Um, Wolf, Wolf Consulting Group does some really great work also across DC to also make sure that there's greater lobbying and work. And because of course we're a 501c3, we have certain lines and barriers. We don't have someone who's a lobbyist on our team. So we have to be really thoughtful about how we do that, but we do also do that work as well. Shared Hope International is another great advocacy org. Yes. Um, I just want to say technology did get the best of us today. So we don't have the video for you today, but. We will plan to um, get it out to you all this week Perfect. by email, which reminds me, if you're not on the Old Fashioned Sunday School email list, come see me afterward. We'll make sure to get it to you. And if you, um, yeah, do that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all. So good.